All right. Welcome back to the Copywriters Podcast with your host, the world's greatest copywriting coach, David Garfinkel, and probably the most anticipated episode, at least for me, that we've ever done. I'm going to hand it over to you, David, and take it away. Thanks, Nathan. That's right, because our guest today is the legendary John Carlton. And in case you don't know who he is, maybe you just haven't been paying attention, but you should. <laughs> John has a, been a force of nature in copywriting and copywriting education for decades. He was Gary Halbert's business partner. He worked in Jay Abraham's office. He's one of the few people allowed to speak on Dan Kennedy's stage. I met Carlton at the Gary Halbert Hurricane Andrews seminar in the early 90s. About 15 years later, Carlton and I did our first seminar together, and we've been friends and partners in crime ever since. True and like that. true that and all great copywriters John's letters and ads have sold millions upon millions upon millions of dollars worth of stuff and there's so much more to say but I'll stop here because I really want you to hear what John has to say I will say this however copy is powerful you're responsible for how you use what you hear in this podcast and most of the time common sense is all you need but if you make extreme claims and if you're writing in offers in highly regulated industries like health and finance and business opportunity, you may want to get a legal review after you write and before you start using your copy. My larger clients do this all the time. So Carlton, welcome and thank you for making time for us and thank you for getting up at three in the morning. I know it's very <laughs> early in Guam where you are right now. Yeah, I'm actually in Nevada and uh, same time zone as you, but I don't, I don't hoe to your hours. I, I live a vampire's life. Although last night I did get to bed by midnight. You had your snack early, huh? Yeah. yeah. So, yes. All right. Well, here, here I am, bed, bed hair and all. I'm here. So let's talk copy. Let's talk copy. You know, the one thing you told me about that really captured my imagination is that there are some old school things that are not that old school at all because they're working 100% in today's market. And, um, you know, I think when you got started, certainly when I got started, there was a lot of rigorous study of. Claude Hopkins and Max Sackheim and John Caples. And these days, people seem to get a little certification they can get for $7 and put on their website to say, <laughs> I am a certified copywriter. And they think that that's all that it takes. And uh, I thought maybe you could sort of fill some people in on some of the basics that if they knew them, their copy would work or work better. Well, back in, when I got started, I was in my early 30s. I think I was 32 and I had my crisis, uh, my midlife crisis. And I realized that, you know, being a slacker and sleeping on people's couches and living out of my car, and, you know, and trying to rely on girlfriends for uh, another place to live, wasn't going to cut it. Nobody was going to save me. And I, I kind of launched my freelance career without any idea what, what I was doing, which was good for eventually becoming a teacher because I made every mistake possible and then went back and fixed it. And so I know, I know the ground very well, but you're right. The old, one of the th reasons I got in with Jay Abraham and through Jay Abraham, I met Gary Halbert and through Gary Halbert, I met Dan Kennedy. And it's this, you know, it's this tree of, of events or this, this, this web, this complex web of, of interaction and, and, uh, net networking. Um, one of the interesting things was I wouldn't have gotten to work with Abraham if I hadn't read Claude Hopkins because he had actually he was actually looking for writers and he was dismissing them out of hand. He would ask them one question: Have Have you read Claude Hopkins eleven times? And no, nobody, I, very few writers in Los Angeles at the time. That's I was living down in L.A. Very few writers, even down there, even though there were a lot of agencies and a lot of direct response agencies, a lot of those writers had no idea what direct response was, even the ones trying to write the direct response ads and stuff. So um, my secret, when I, was, I had been working for agencies uh, as, a, as the guy they snuck in the back door, as I like to say, they snuck me in the back door to do the jobs their own hired staff couldn't do because I had gone out and done all the 
all the uh, the intellectual footwork. I, I got it, took a speed reading course, went to the Torrance Municipal Library and read everything. And I forget what it is, a Dewey Decimal System, 600 to 1200 or something, you know, salesmanship, uh, copywriting, writing, uh, advertising, marketing, all of us. I just, I just plowed through every book I could. I, I take stacks of books over, plop them down, go through them, you know, kind of speed going through them, pick the three that I needed to read more closely and then followed up on any clues I got into that. All of that led me to, of course, Claude Hopkins um, and uh, John Caples uh, and um, uh, Stackheim and all, all, all those other guys. But the Claude Hopkins thing, when I got, uh, Abraham tried to dismiss me because he assumed I hadn't, he assumed at that point I hadn't read Claude Hopkins 11 times and I had. And I said, you're wrong. I have done that. He like, he like paused and we, we kind of clicked at that point. And when I met Halbert, it was kind of the same thing. It was like the language we spoke was based in knowing, even if we didn't use the same words, it was based in that fundamental knowledge that came from guys who had written about advertising and copywriting and marketing in the 1920s and, and even earlier. And so Claude Hobbes was like a secret handshake among the guys who knew what direct response should be about back then. So, um, and, and, it, it would, and one of the things that I was doing was I was trying to, one of the reasons I was attracted to Abraham and then Gary Halbert and then Dan Kennedy, of course, was I became enamored with the guys who used to do door-to-door -door salesmanship. The guys who... You know, Halbert did that for years. Uh, Abraham did it for a time. I'm not sure about Dan, but Dan was a consummate face-to-face -face salesman. And I just started, I, I figured I, I can go one of two paths. I can either go out and get a job and do door-to-door -door salesmanship, or I can put on my big boy pants, sit down, and, and start to glean information from these guys who have done it. You don't need to necessarily have done everything uh, that, that's necessary to do to lead a good life or have a good career. But if you don't do it and it's necessary, you better find a way to glean what is important from the guys who have done it. Find mentors, in other words. So, you know, it's, it's like if, if you're going to try to hit a baseball, you know, on, on a professional league basis, you've got to go out and do it. You can read for decades about hitting a baseball until you go out and stand in the batter's box and have somebody throw a fastball high and tight. You're not going to understand what has to happen. You're not going to understand the physical parameters of it. Writing is a little different. Uh, it is an intellectual capability, uh, an, an intellectual exercise, and you can read, you can get your mentoring third hand through reading uh, I, but you've got to keep trying it out. One of the mistakes I think a lot of younger writers make is they, they go and they read another book without putting the last book they read into action. So what, what I did was I kept taking jobs and I wouldn't allow myself to read the next book until I had put something into action that I'd gleaned from the book before. So, it, and, and I realized even before it, it, it's now a common saying that when people go to an event or a seminar, you're going to come away with one good idea. You know, for people that have 20 pages of notes in a seminar, that doesn't go anywhere. I mean, good for you for taking all those notes, but those notes are going to wind up in the round file or in a file somewhere and put away. And you're never going to look at them again. If you come away with one, one to three ideas, but certainly one idea from one, one speaker that you heard that gets you going and you, and you move on that. Uh, Howard used to say, you know, uh, uh, success is 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 uh, movement. Um, if 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 you can ju just just do that. So I used to like to pick up one idea from a book. If I wasn't picking up one idea, or I didn't suspect there was going to be at least one good idea from any book I was reading, I tossed it, and I got really really good at tossing books. And in fact, the minute I gave myself permission, way back then in my early thirties. It, whether it was fiction or, or business or whatever I was reading, if at any time I got bored or, or I got frustrated or I decided this book wasn't worth anything, I slammed it shut and uh, metaphorically threw it against the wall and bounced it into the trash can or recycled it or took it back to the library or whatever. I didn't waste time with books. I was very 
uh, impatient about that. And that paid off a lot because I, I, lear- I, I didn't just start on page one. I would go through all the book, look at the index, look at the headlines, go through, read, read a couple of words from each chapter, look at photos, read the captions, do all that stuff. All that stuff is like a preamble before you sit down and say, this book is now something I'm going to read. Then you sit down, you start at page one, maybe, and you go through and do all that. Yeah, let me, let me unpack some of the good sure. stuff you just said, because um, it's, it's really important. Um, copywriting, becoming a master copywriter is not really comparable to getting a, a PhD in English literature. It's, right. it's, it's more like becoming a master welder right? Like you got to know how to put things together when everything is going uh, haywire. And you got to know those specific skills so well backwards and forwards that you can do blindfolded behind your back because you're you're dealing with your livelihood and other people's livelihoods. And you don't have time to sit there and analyze and ruminate and second guess. You have to go. And The, the, and so um, there was somebody, uh, I happen to like him a lot. He, he was a lawyer who was on TV at a, a Capitol Hill hearing, and he made the Republicans and the Democrats look like total amateurs because they were. And yeah. he spent, spent half an hour, and I, I, I did a little research on him, and he said there were, there were two quotes that he really liked. And I'm going to paraphrase them maybe because I don't have them memorized. But one was Bobby Knight, the basketball coach, and he said, the will to win is nothing. Everyone has that. It's the will to prepare to win that matters. Mm-hmm. And that's what you're talking about. The, the second thing is that famous Mike Tyson quote, you can have every fight plan in the world, but uh, that, that'll that all change once you get punched in the mouth. In and, the nose, he said, yeah. In the nose. So I want to point out to everyone that that's what you're talking about. Exactly. You knew that the deal was, all right, the shit was going to come down at some point if you got good at this. Right. It's like, you're not getting into uh, copywriting to have a um, a life of unfettered peace, harmony, and understanding. As unfunny as those things are, Elvis Costello might say, um, that's not it. I mean, the deal, the deal, the real, the reality is you're you're actually poking a hole in the fabric of the universe if you have a good promotion. You're changing things. With change comes disruption and upset and emergencies and problems that have to be fixed right now that you had no idea were going to happen. So your tool belt better be full of good sharpened tools that you know how to use. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I, I used to say a lot and actually I still say this, so it's a qualified saying. Um, I would rather take a streetwise salesman and turn him into a copywriter than take a guy with a PhD in English lit and try to turn him into a salesman. Um, the more important element there is the salesmanship, is the, the understanding of, of, the, of the arc of persuasion, of presenting things in a palatable manner, of stirring the uh, innermost desires, fears, and, and greed of, of, of your prospect. You know, the, um, I, I talk about copywriters and civilians. And, you know, it's like uh, Gar, uh, uh, Garf, you and I are part of the Gonk group, uh, right. what we call the modern Algonquin table. And, and uh, we hang out with a lot of other writers. And we can talk in language and metaphors and stories that are easily understood because it's part of the basis of our careers and our lives. Civilians can come in, they, they don't have a clue what, 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 what we're talking about. And a lot of that comes from um, uh, just experience. Um, I also have writers, uh, even experienced writers, who on, after they hear me talk, will privately come up to me and say, you know, I didn't really get that particular thing because I, my base is even deeper than that. My base goes back to Halbert and, and you know, and, and, and Abraham and Kennedy. You know, we were all buds and we were equals and we had this deep thing. And their roots go even deeper. Uh, Halbert was 12 years old, older than, than I was. Uh, uh, and and he, he, while I came from direct mail, he actually, you know, he came from the real direct mail when it was cutthroat. So when I was doing it, uh, print advertisement, uh, uh, print, uh, excuse me, print, print advertising in, 
in uh, magazines were, were, were hitting their stride. There, there were a lot of different options, but Gary made his way in direct mail and in direct response in the newspapers back when no one else was doing it, when it was, it was a lost art. Um, and it's the language I had to relearn the language of even those older guys. And Gary had learned it from guys who had learned it from guys before well, him. But and it's this long, long trail of, of people who. Right. Yeah. And, 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 and let me drill down on one, on one thing you were saying, because you were a psychology major in college. I was a psychology minor. When I read Claude Hopkins and I actually read it 15 times, I didn't know about Jay Abraham's rule, but I saw that David Ogilvie said seven times. I, I thought, well, seven is good. On the cover, it says, if you haven't read this book seven times, and the book is called Scientific Advertising. I don't think we ever said the title of the book yet. Scientific My Advertising. My Life in Advertising slash Scientific Advertising. Actually, two of his books. Is. When I read that, it didn't even occur to me until this moment, but it so changed my thinking that everything I learned about psychology in college was wrong except that Freud was right that sex and death were like major um, motivations or, or obsessions with people. And just sometimes that, a cigar is just a cigar. And sometimes a cigar is, yeah, he said that too. Yeah. Uh, of course, I don't like cigars. But if you take that one, one thing about human psychology being fundamentally different and you spread that out to everything Halbert and Kennedy and Abraham knew and everything you learned, you realize as a successful copywriter, you're going to not only have different language, you're going to see the world differently. You're going to understand, right? I have another saying, the salesmen lead better lives. That doesn't mean that salesmen are better people. It doesn't mean that they're morally superior in any way. It just means that to be a salesman, to be able to take someone and persuade them not to say, when, I, I, I like to say one, one of the easiest things to do is to get someone to say, hey, you know what, that's a pretty good product you have there. And you know, some, some, sometime down the line, I think I may be going to think about buying that product. Really easy to get people to that point. Mm -hmm. Really hard to get them from that point to, wait, wait, stop. Here's my credit card. Please run it right now. The diff even though the actions are right next to each other, that that space in between there is what makes the a-list versus the rookies uh what was i saying uh, salesmen lead better lives the reason salesmen lead better lives is they can't operate with the luxury that civilians do of thinking the world ought to be a certain way or people ought to behave in a certain way or things should happen in a certain way that the universe should have should have a just and reasonable reaction to excuse me while i choke on my latte please continue <laughs> and uh so so when you live in the real world it's 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 not what things should be it's how they are and salesmen have to go through a real harsh reality check they it's it's you don't pay attention to what people say you pay attention to what they do uh, you don't even pay it and you pay deeper attention to what they do, trying to understand their motivations behind it and the stories they're telling themselves. Every human has a story they tell themselves. I am buying this Porsche because it's a fine automobile and it's going to have great resale value. And I just like to drive fast. That's the story they tell themselves. It's complete horseshit. It's, you know, they're buying it because they're going through a midlife crisis and they think their potency is waning and they're just kind of going a little bonkers. Uh, but they can't tell themselves that because then they wouldn't buy the, the Porsche. They'd take the money and they'd go sit on a shrink's couch for a while and, and try to talk this stuff out. But understanding that, so when a salesman looks at somebody, looks at a prospect, and, 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 and people, you know, we, we have to operate very carefully around civilians uh, because if we talk about greed and, and fear, for example, which are the basis of almost all advertising and marketing, people, people view those words negatively. And so civilians get all upset. Oh, you're just preying on people's fears and you're feeding people's greed. They're just convenient words to an advertising man of how to understand what's going on in the amygdala of the, you know, in the deepest recesses, the lizard brain and the ape brain uh, of, of the prospects we're dealing with. It's, it's I want, must have, you know, you know, uh, it, it's, 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 I, I, I like to say we, we, we're not, we're not, 
we're not just recently removed from the jungle. We actually have one foot in the jungle and one foot on the pavement of modern civilization. And the more you understand that, the more things make sense. Now, now there, there's a caveat to saying that salesmen lead better lives because they, they live in a perpetual reality check. A lot of civilians also think, oh, they, you must hate people because people lie, they're capricious, they're bribable, they're, uh, they're hypocrites, all this stuff comes to light. And it's, it's exactly the opposite. Actually, when you understand people at, when you meet them where they're at, you actually love them more. I, I love humanity and all their foibles and all the weirdness and stuff, but I know how to navigate through the world of hypocrisy and, and you know, blind, you know, uh, people sleepwalking through their lives. I know how to navigate through this and find, find the really good people to become friends with, help those who are kind of sleepwalking but want to wake up uh, to make people's lives better. You know, it's, it's corny, but, you know, one of the best things that, that we do as entrepreneurs and copywriters is we make people's lives better. You know, if you're, if I, I, I've asked people in seminars, I, I would, I would, I would stop mid, mid uh, uh, rant and I would say, wait, who here has a product, a, a shitty product they're ashamed of that they're selling? You know, and nobody raises their hand. I go, okay, that's good. Some of you are probably lying, but you know, for the most part, if you have a good ethical product that will help someone in their lives, then shame on you if you don't use everything in your power to get them to understand, oh, wow, I need this right now. I need to buy this right now. Because you can, you can talk to people who are depressed and broke and, and they, they, they have no idea what's, uh, what's coming next and they're just lost. They're like floating on the ocean of life with no direction and no anything. And you have a very simple way for them to kind of get direction and get themselves together and understand it actually makes some money then shame on you if you don't do everything you can to get past their reluctance to listen to you, their skepticism over being sold, their, the idea that if they're being sold, if, if, if they're getting the idea from outside of themselves, it can't be worth much because they have to do it themselves. A lot of people think that. They think, I can't reach out for help because that would be weak. And they don't understand you're weak for not reaching out, but you have to couch these things. You know, my just, just to finish up, my – my consultations, and I do a lot of them, they're very expensive, and a lot, of, a lot of high-powered people come to me for consultations. I tell almost everyone the same advice. Stop whining and grow the fuck up. And that is, I don't say that, but that is- Oh, yes, you do. I have said it to some, but not, not to civilians. You can't say that to civilians. It hurts them. Yeah. Um, so, so, the, so I couch that and I'll say, oh, well, you've got to, you've got to try to get your ducks in alignment. Uh, let's, let's, let's see if we can find some way to, to address you, these immediate problems you're, you're having and then the long-term problems you're having and all of these things. So try to, try to make this palatable to them. But basically, I'm telling them to grow up. And right. Stop, stop whining. Listen, uh, I would love it if you would come back next week. We have, I've been informed um, through a secret channel that we've just run out of time. Okay. But, um, would you come back next week? Yeah, sure. Okay. And, and if people, th I mean, this is like one, one hundredth of 1%. There's, there's a couple of things. Uh, John dash Carlton.com. And we'll put it in the show notes is, is your website. That's, that's my blog. That's the one stop shop. That's <clears throat> my books, my courses and over 10, maybe 12 years now of, of blog posts. Actually, more than that. Gee, probably 15 years. Free blog, blog posts going way back. All good. Yeah. The, the other thing is I want to zero in on one thing, and we'll put the link in the show notes for that, too. I helped you. I participated in getting the simple writing system started. For people who are not ready for mentoring from you or from me but would like to get started, that's the one thing I point to. And it's not because you're my friend or because I was part of it. It's because... I haven't found anything else that good. And yeah. I'm uh, kind of angry and ashamed that I haven't been able to come up with it myself. <laughs> I haven't. So um, if you go to carltonsystem.com, you can find that. I recommend it. Um, I'm, I'm not, I don't teach it, and I don't think you do either, but you have a highly trained person, 
and it's all your stuff. It's a really good system. It's so. me on the videos. You're getting you're getting mentoring from me via video. But yes, and I every every couple of years I I will teach a class occasionally, although I haven't in over a year. But yes. Okay, good. So you, you'll come back next week. Promise. Sure. Pinky swear. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. All right. And until next week, if you want to get more of your copywriters fix, head on over to copywriterspodcast.com. And I'm going to be waiting on pins and needles until we come back. So uh, thank you, John. And thank you, David. And we'll catch you next time. Thanks, Nathan.